word I shared this morning and I feel I should share it again. John told me, or told the, the, the church last week, that on this streaming and on the web page, over 150,000 hits. Wow. That's an awful lot of people looking in at Trinity. Amen? 150,000. And what really blew me away, and I, I shared this this morning, so forgive me if I share it again. We got a, a lady in New Zealand. You don't get much farther away than New Zealand. And she gets up a quarter to three in the morning so that she can listen and be part of the streaming. Wow. Now, it makes me realize how many people are beginning to look in and, and watch what's going on. People are hungry. And some people, because they can't get to church, or they can't get to a spirit-filled church, they're now watching our streaming uh, and that is their church, basically, now. So, hallelujah. Now, I've got to explain in advance that whatever I said tonight, I've gathered from many, many sources. I've borrowed from you, and I've borrowed from there, and I've also what my own understanding and what I've gathered as well is in this message. Now, I introduced the message this morning. About three years ago, God gave me a prophetic word. It was all of three words long. God doesn't waste words. He just gave me three words. And of course, when you receive a word from the Lord, you expect it the next moment. You expect it to happen the following day, or at least the following week. Well, I've learned over the years, that's not God's way. He very often gives a prophetic word, and it might be a year or two years, before it even comes into being. Because God starts moving things around and putting things into place. Now the word that I received, as I said, was just three words. Now it begins. Alright, now that, that was three years ago. So I want, God has prompted me this week that I've got to come back to those words. Because now it begins. Amen. Amen. I want to enlarge a little bit on those words. Can we make sure the heating's off? Because I'm beginning to uh, grow a little bit out here. Friends, it's the easiest thing to become depressed and discouraged by the things that can cause a desert in our lives or even a wilderness in our lives. It is so easy for these things to come upon us. Because you and I are surrounded on every side by trouble and tragedy, misfortune, heartache, discouragement, loss, destruction, decay. Do you want me to go on? Ruin, devastation, desolation, refuge, rubbish. Which all brings a state of wilderness into our lives if we're not careful. These desolate things fill our world and they stalk our streets. And if we're not careful, they can actually affect our spirit. We're, in, we're living in a world where decay pollutes the air and it poisons the water. And if we are not very careful, these areas, these wilderness areas will kill our joy. They'll dash our hopes. They'll snatch our dreams and our visions away. Are you with me on this? You understand yeah. what I'm talking We are actually, as, as believers, surrounded on every side by desolation, ruin, waste and destruction. And it seems that everything is lost. It seems like it's all over. It seems as if the fat lady can at last sing. <laughs> all right? But hallelujah, that's when God chooses to move. And I'm reminded he did the same when they crucified his son Jesus. And they put him in a tomb. 
Satan thought he'd won. Everything looked as though it was finished. Then God moved. And he raised his son from the dead. Then it began. Because he lives, we live. And hallelujah, church. My scripture tells me we don't just live, but we've got abundant life. We have the fullness of life. And by the way, God doesn't want any one of us to have anything else but abundant life. Now God is about to bring another move of the Spirit into this place. Amen. And upon you. Are you ready for it? Yes. Amen. God is about to do it. I said the other day, I'm going on holiday. And I'm a little bit upset about going on holiday because I've got an awful feeling God's going to move while I'm away. Amen. I'm probably going to get a text telling me how wonderful God is moving. <laughs> Turn to your neighbour and say to them, now it begins. Now I'm enjoying that moment, so I'm going to linger there for a moment. This is a word for someone here tonight. The more desolate your wilderness, the more God will do. Because God operates on the basis of need. So whatever the need is, if it's big, God will fill it. Amen? Amen? If God is to do more in your life, then there's got to be a need. Yep. Many of us don't want to admit that we've got a need because we love and chase the plenty. We want to have more than enough. Yeah. We simply don't like to be in need. We don't like the wilderness place. But if God is to do more in our life to bring his glory, then we've got to allow him to reveal the needs in our life. And there will have to be areas to which only he can totally supply the need. Yeah. Amen? Amen? I know for a fact that many will try to fill it with worldly things, but it won't work. Because there are areas that only God can fill. I recall when I used to go and preach up the valleys, they were interesting days. I used to go out in the morning out to Monmouth, come over and have lunch and I'd then be up in Evervale, come home for tea and then I'd be back up to Bryn Mawr in the evening. That was cutting your teeth preaching that was. It was uh, but I used to go to churches and they were dying. But the ones who were in the church were oblivious to the need. They were, every week they were just going through the motion of church. They had become so used to living in a barren wilderness. If you haven't got a need, then what have you got God to trust for? Think about it. Yeah. We must have a need. And we must be admitting to that need. If you haven't got a problem or a need, then there's no cause for you to go and be dependent on God. He's no longer the overjoyer. And if you don't want to know what that means, the provider. Okay? If we don't need a provider, then God's not going to move in our life. So how many of you admit honestly that you've got a need for God to do something? Well, that's half of you. Okay. I'll talk to you. I need to remind you, it's wrong, and I, if you want more on this, go and listen to my sermon this morning. I need to remind you that it's wrong to reject the wilderness. Because the wilderness is precisely what triggers the divine supply of God's river. The life of victory is lived 
in the barren place, not on the mountain top. It's our weakness in warfare that calls God's power into battle. It's the barrenness, the desolation that releases these rivers of power into our lives. Many years ago, oh and it's a long, long time ago, I went to listen to an American preacher called Jerry Savelle. He was in his early days. I can remember him now. He demonstrated to us how he learned to read the Bible. He said, the problem I had in the beginning is that when I used to start reading the Bible, I used to fall asleep. Every time he picked the Bible up, he would fall asleep. Satan used to lull him into sleep. So he said, I found a way around it. I used to stand on the edge of an empty bath and read. And he said, I knew I had to stay awake. Because if I fell, I was going to hurt myself. So he said, that's the way I learned to read the Word of God. He said, I don't recommend you doing it, but that was the way that he did it. He disciplined himself, exactly. Well, we went to listen to Jerry, and he opened my mind to what we know as the Valley of Baca. Yeah. If you don't know about the Valley of Baca, it's in Psalm 84. Yeah. Let me read it to you. How lovely is your dwelling place, O Lord Almighty. My soul yearns, even faints for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh cry out for the living God. Even the sparrow has found a home, and the swallow a nest for herself, where she may have a young, a place near your altar, O Lord Almighty, my King and my God. Blessed are those who dwell in your house. They are ever praising you. Blessed are those whose strength is in you, who have their heart set on pilgrimage. As they pass through the valley of Baca, they make it a place of springs. The autumn rains also covers it with pools. They go from strength to strength, till each appears before God in Zion. Hear my prayer, O Lord God Almighty. Listen to me, O God of Jacob. Look upon our shield, O God. Look with favour on your anointed one. Better is one day in your courts than a thousand elsewhere. I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than dwell in the tents of the wicked. For the Lord God is a sun and shield. The Lord bestows favour and honour. No good thing does he withhold from those who walk his blameless. O Lord Almighty, blessed is the man who trusts you. I looked up the meaning of the word backer in Holman's Bible Dictionary. It's the place of weeping. A valley in Psalm 84, and it goes on to say, which reflects a poetic play on words, describes a person forced to go through a time of weeping, who found God turned tears into a well providing water. I know that some of you are in a time of weeping. You're in a time of adversity. Maybe your pain is private, that no one even knows that you're hurting. But God knows. Maybe you feel trapped. Our adversities may have different situations. They may be different hurts, different events. But it's very much the same valley. The literal valley of Baca is a thousand miles away in a land that most of us will never travel. But the spiritual valley of Baca is very familiar. We all know the road and have probably all been down it many times. The valley of Baca is a desolate place. A place that sane people avoid at all costs. It's dry, it's barren, it's isolated. The heat of the valley drains the weary traveller. Hope is waning, despair quietly takes its place. Many years ago, 
and I'm being personal now, I went through the valley of Baca. And as I entered it, I was afraid. But I knew that I had to pass through the valley. Because on the other side was what I needed. What I had been promised. So I set my heart on that journey. Now I shared earlier that the wilderness or the desolate place is what God very often allows to come into our affairs, into our situation. Your desert doesn't necessarily have to be of your own making. It could have been caused by someone else. It could have been caused by a circumstance or a happening that happened long ago. Even before you were born. And some of you are in the desert because of someone else's sin. You've inherited a debt which you did not make. It may be a fractured relationship which you did not cause. A problem which you didn't create. But there are some of us in the desert of our own making. Bad decision making. Wasted lives. Ruined relationships. Wasted finance. Do I need to go on? But in either case, the good news for you is this. He's the God of the second chance. Amen. And the third chance. And the fourth Amen. chance. And the umpteenth chance. God never gives up. And I'm saying it to you tonight. God's going to do it again. So let me bring a verse of scripture to you. I'm in Isaiah 43. I'm only reading two verses. Verse 18. Forget the former things. Do not dwell on the past. See, I am doing a new thing. Now it springs up. Do you not perceive it? I am making a way in the desert and streams in the wasteland. Now each of us has got to take hold of that verse and we've got to let it go down into our spirits. Turn to your neighbour and confess to them, God is doing a new thing. Amen? Amen. But I would say this to you, we need to change our focus. We need to stop looking behind and we need to start looking ahead. Amen. Amen. Forget the former things. Don't dwell on the past. You see, if you're continually looking behind you, you can't see where you're going. Is that true? Yeah. If you're ever going to move onto the new things that Jesus Christ wants to bring into your life, You've got to learn that you can't depend upon past victories to sustain you in, into the new things. All right? I'll get my teeth right in a minute. Okay? <laughs> Seriously, if you want to go ahead, it's no good looking over the old things. You've got to be looking for what God wants to do. Because I tell you this, typical God, you do it different. If you were expecting God to do it again, you'd probably do it totally different to anything you've ever had it before from God. Let me use the nation of Israel as an example. Since leaving Egypt, the children of Israel had many, many victories. They conquered the land of Canaan. They fought off and won many battles. They even survived the split in their country. And yet, they ended up in captivity. All the previous victories were doing nothing to set them free. Do you understand what I'm saying? Amen. They spent 400 years in Egypt in captivity. Previous to that, they had all the victories and all of it. But it didn't do them any good looking back to that. They needed a new work. They needed a new miracle, a new victory. 
So the question is this. It isn't what God has done. The question has got to be this. What is God doing in our lives now? Yeah. That's the question. What's he doing now? Not what he has done. We all know we're saved. Do we know we're saved? Amen. Yes. Amen? Are we born again? Yes. Are we filled with the Spirit? Yes. Yeah, hallelujah. That's past. We should be looking for what God wants to bring in now. Even more so. What's the miracle that God wants to bring you? What is it that, that you want him to do right now? Only you know. In order to move on to the new things in Christ, you've got to know you cannot allow past failures to possess you. And there are some who are possessed by their past. We need to shed the past and we need to be looking on with God. Forget the former things. The children of Israel failed God miserably. Every time he blessed them with good things, they went back to evil things. He gave them a temple, they gave him idol worship. He gave them truth, they lived and proclaimed the lie. Yeah. God gave them his commands, they lived like they were, they were just suggestions to them. God gave them wealth, they used it to abuse the poor. God gave them himself, they gave him nothing except rejection. The children of Israel did not deserve to, re to, to receive anything from God. Yet the amazing thing is, he still loves them. Yeah. And he earnestly wants to see them change. Yeah. So look at God's message to you. Forget the former things. Do not dwell on the past. See, I am doing a new thing. You see, God wasn't condemning them for the past. They could do nothing to change it. Instead, God was holding out the hand of hope, and he's doing it tonight. God is holding out the hand of hope tonight. He is in fact saying, forget about the past. I'm giving you an opportunity to start over. Amen. I believe that God is at work. He's doing a new thing. And we are not even seeing it. God is at work making things happen that we have never seen happen before. Amen. And yet some are not perceiving it. They're not getting it. We have a God who can make all things new. Jesus, our Redeemer, in whom we are all new creations. Amen? Yeah. Our indwelling Holy Spirit brings us new life. So on God's behalf, I'm sharing this. And get hold of it. I am about to do a new thing. Now it springs forth. Do you not perceive it? I will make a way in the wilderness and the rivers in the desert. Friend, I'm insisting that if you would just open your eyes and look, you would see that God is doing a new thing. God's already at work. Don't you see it? Don't you get it? I'm very tempted to shout, wake up. <laughs> I knew the wakey wakey was going to come. I should never have shared that, should I? <laughs> Wakey, wakey, yes. It is time for wakey, wakey, but not the angel. It's time for us to wake up. We are now in a time when God is setting the church up for the unveiling of his plan. God is wanting to line this church up for a move of his spirit for this generation. Do you not see what God is doing here at Trinity? This is the truth. And each and every one of us have got a part in what God wants to do. It's not just the leadership. The whole church has got to be involved. I shared earlier that you will never be able 
to enter into your tomorrow as long as you're standing in your yesterday. How many of you want to enter into your tomorrow? Amen. You don't want to be standing in your yesterday. There's nothing there for you. Even the Apostle Paul refused to allow the past and the things that had already happened to keep him there. He made his mind up he was going to pursue God. Let me read Philippians to you. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining towards what is ahead, I press on towards the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. You see, what has happened to you in the past can do one or two things to you. It can either be a springboard or it can be a big anchor. Yeah. Now what are you choosing tonight, church? That you're going to let the past anchor you here or are you going to use it as a springboard to go forward? If you, I urge you to listen to this morning's message. Yeah. It's entitled... I'm not a failure. Yeah. All right? Yeah. I'm not a failure. Are you going to allow your past experiences to hold you back? Or will you just use them as a lesson of what not to do? God allowed you to go through these experiences so that you might grow in spirit and counsel. Again, I reiterate, God's got a new thing in mind. The things that you thought would never happen are about to be. Hallelujah. And the things that you thought would always be are about to cease. Hallelujah. The way things have been are not the way things will always be. I've got to say this, change is coming. You see, we, we at Trinity are experiencing the Spirit, but there are those who have already settled into a rut. Well, God's going to bounce you out of the rut. All right, there is a change coming. It's not a political promise. And by heck, I've heard enough promises this week with Hillary and Trump. I've got to be honest. Goodness me. It's a God promise. He's promised change. Romans 4. The God who gives life to the dead and calls into being things that were not. He's the one who's making the promise. Our God can call things into being that are not. Friends, this is our God. Your God. Your Father. And he can bring about the miracle that you need in your life. Amen. You may be feeling half dead. But I tell you this. God can bring you back to life. So open your eyes. God has not forgotten the vision that he gave to us. His plan is still to bring that fulfillment of that vision. I'm in Habakkuk now. You won't keep up with me, so don't try. All right? I'm in Habakkuk chapter 2, which talks about everything is for an appointed time. And we're in that appointed time. Let me read it to you. Write down the revelation and make it plain on tablets, so that a herald may run with it. For the revelation awaits an appointed time. It speaks of the end and will not be proved false. Though it linger, wait for it. It will certainly come and will not delay. Amen. We're in it. I actually waited for God to move tonight. God is looking to remove the blinkers that have kept us from seeing his plan. God is looking to uncover and expose the wells that the enemy has covered up. Genesis 2. Isaac reopened the wells that had been dug in the time of his father Abraham, which the Philistines had stopped up after Abraham died. 
And he gave them the same names his father had given them. Yeah. I shared the other week, I went to a church once, and I challenged them about the wells that they had done. And at the end of the service, they had an elders meeting and I was banned from the church. <laughs> Another church I was banned from. <laughs> we don't drink from our wells. No. We drink from his well. Amen. Amen. Let's turn back to drinking from God's well. Amen. You see, you won't find the presence or the power of God in, ma in man-dug wells. You might find man's intellect in there, but that's all you're going to find. Many of you know that personally I've waited a long time for what God is doing here at Trinity. Friends, I've lingered. Next year I would have waited 25 years to see this day. And I'm going to sing. No, I won't sing. I just. The hallelujah. You want to say hallelujah too? I just. I just say the words of one of the first choruses that I ever heard. This is the day. Amen. 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 This is the day. Amen. Church, will you not open your eyes and see what's going on amongst you? A hundred or so years ago, our nation began to move away from God. And it began partly with, with the church moving away from God. Let me tell you, the 19th century was a century of passionate Christians. We had people like Charles Loder who risked having cholera when he went to bring Jesus to the people of Wapping. If you didn't know that, Wapping was full of cholera in those days. They were drinking from the wrong wells. And then you had William Wilberforce he gave up a high-powered parliamentary career to campaign for the abol abolition of slavery. But then we came to the 20th century, and it became more tea vicar, <laughs> a very genteel, unestablished religion that had little to do with lives being changed or prayers being answered. I was calling on the God who shakes mountains. Yeah. And guess what? The God who serves cups of Earl Grey ah. and cucumber sandwiches hasn't proved very popular. No. There's got to be a change. And the real true God is about to bring it in. Oh, yeah. Sadly, there are those who have become so despondent with the desolation inside and around them that they've actually given up hope. They've resigned to what they have and where they are. I agree things are bad. <laughs> and if I look around, they appear to be getting worse. But we cannot blame the condition of our country on the loss. We have been promised by God that if his people will repent, he will hear, forgive and he will heal. Amen. Two chronicles. Let me read it to you. If my people which are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray, seek my face, turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. The things we have seen, we don't need to blame on political parties or leaders or the lost world. Neither can we be changed by those things. We've got to own up to our own issue and take a long, hard look in the mirror. You see, Edmund Burke said it, and you all know this, all that is necessary for the triumph of evil is that good men do nothing. Yeah. And the church has done nothing. Yeah. Someone said that a Christian is someone who feels repentance on Sunday for what he did on Saturday and is going to do again on Monday. 
And I can't argue with that. We need revival. Amen. We need revival in this land. Many will say, I don't believe that we will ever see another great revival. What they're really saying, I don't believe that God is powerful enough to bring another revival. Friends, I repeat, the answer is not to be found in a political party. It's not going to be found in a tele-evangelist. It will not even be seen in a series of church meetings that we call revival meetings. Because if songs and sermons could have brought about revival, we would have been in revival a long time ago. <coughs> revival will begin when God's people, that's individuals, get themselves right with God. It starts with a believer. It then spreads to the church, then to the community, then to the town, then to the state, then to the country, and even across the world. Amen. But it starts with you. Amen. I love what evangelist Gypsy Smith used to say. He used to draw a circle around himself with a piece of chalk. And his prayer was Lord, this, Lord, Send a revival and let it begin inside this circle. That's it, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, 2 Kings 18. Now it came to pass in the third year of Obeah, <coughs> son of Elah, king of Israel, that Hezekiah, the son of Ahaz, king of Judah, began to reign. Twenty and five years old was he when he began to reign, and he reigned twenty and nine years in Jerusalem. His mother's name also was Abi, the daughter of Zechariah. And he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord, according to all that David his father did. Ezekiah was the son of Ahaz. I don't know whether you know your Bible, but Ahaz was one of the worst kings yeah. in Judah's history. And yet, Ezekiah was one of the best. Ezekiah inherited a mess. The people were superstitious, and because of his father, they were idolatrous. He didn't complain about anything. He didn't blame the mess on his predecessor. He just began to get on and change things. Friends, are you ready for change so that God can fulfill what he has started? Are you ready? Because the change starts with us. Once again, I say, you can't blame the condition of our country on the lost. We have been promised by God that if we will repent, he will heal, forgive, and heal. The thing we have seen, we mustn't try and blame on other things like politics. We must own up to our own issues. I'm not saying that we can make this a perfect world. I'm not saying that we can cure sin. But I'm going to say this, this church can make a difference. Amen. If we all start believing in ourselves and believing in God, we can make a difference. Amen. And it can start here. Amen. Amen. Amen? Amen. How can we make a difference? Humble yourself. Pray. Seek God's face. And turn from our wicked ways. And trust God to bring revival. It's coming. I got it in my bones. I got it in my spirit. It's coming. And friends, if you feel tonight that you are a desolate place in your life, don't despair. Shout hallelujah and allow God to use those desolate places to begin a new thing in your life. Amen. I spoke about it this morning. Yeah. All right? Where's victory? It's on the other side of failure. 
As I said this morning, to get the victory, you sometimes have to go through the house of failure. Listen to it. I surprised even myself this morning. Praise God. You now know and see the need in your life and let God fill it. Say to yourself, now it begins. Now it begins. And it is beginning. I can feel it here tonight. I feel it in my spirit. It is beginning. Hallelujah. If anyone wants prayer for anything, please just make your way to the front. Thank you, Gillian. Thank you for those watching.